This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. She's buried beneath a silver birch tree, down towards the old train tracks, her grave marked with a cairn. Not more than a little pile of stones, really. I didn't want to draw attention to her resting place, but I couldn't leave her without remembrance. She'll sleep peacefully there, no one to disturb her, no sounds but birdsong and the rumble of passing trains. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl. Three for a girl. I'm stuck on three. I just can't get any further. My head is thick with sounds, my mouth thick with blood. Three for a girl. I can hear the magpies. They're laughing, mocking me, a raucous cackling. A tiding. Bad tidings. I can see them now, black against the sun. Not the birds. Something else. Someone's coming. Someone is speaking to me. Now look. Now look what you made me do. Rachel. Friday the 5th of July, 2013. Morning. There is a pile of clothing on the side of the train tracks. Light blue cloth. A shirt, perhaps, jumbled up with something dirty white. It's probably rubbish, part of a load fly-tipped into the scrubby little wood up the bank. It could have been left behind by the engineers who work this part of the track. They're here often enough. Or it could be something else. My mother used to tell me that I had an overactive imagination. Tom said that too. I can't help it. I catch sight of these discarded scraps, a dirty t-shirt or a lonesome shoe, and all I can think of is the other shoe and the feet that fitted into them. The train jolts and scrapes and screeches back into motion. The little pile of clothes disappears from view, and we trundle on towards London, moving at a brisk jogger's pace. Someone in the seat behind me gives a sigh of helpless irritation. The 804 slow train from Ashbury to Euston contests the patience of the most seasoned commuter. The journey is supposed to take 54 minutes, but it rarely does. This section of the track is ancient, decrepit, beset with signalling problems and never-ending engineering works. The train crawls along. It judders past warehouses and water towers, bridges and sheds, past modest Victorian houses, their backs turn squarely to the track. My head leaning against the carriage window, I watch these houses roll past me like a tracking shot in a film. I see them as others do not. Even their owners probably don't see them from this perspective. Twice a day, I am offered a view into other lives, just for a moment. There's something comforting about the sight of strangers safe at home. Someone's phone is ringing, an incongruously joyful and upbeat song. They're slow to answer. It jingles on and on around me. I can feel my fellow commuters shift in their seats, rustle their newspapers, tap at their computers. The train lurches and sways around the bend, slowing as it approaches a red signal. I try not to look up. I try to read the free newspaper I was handed on my way into the station, but the words blur in front of my eyes. Nothing holds my interest. In my head, I can still see that little pile of clothes lying at the edge of the track. Abandoned. 